had some follow-up questions from the first math video, uh, a few different types of problems, um, and then wanted to do a few more examples of problems that I covered in the last session. So here's what we're gonna be covering in this video, and let's go ahead and get started. So in my last video, I mentioned adding, or not counting zeros, but instead stepping up. And I think this does a better job of illustrating why that's important. So instead of writing out two million, um, times 50, and then the five times two is a 10, one, two, three, four, five, six, and then bring that in. That's gonna get really messy really fast. So it's very easy to truncate your two million, just write down two M times 50. And then you can do this one of two ways. So option one, you could either say two times 50 is 100, and then you keep your million, or option two is you have two times five is equal to 10, and then you add that extra zero, and now you have 100 million that way. So both very easy ways to do it. Much, much better than trying to count all these zeros, and you're gonna shift the comma over or miscount the number of zeros. So definitely avoid counting a bunch of zeros. Moving on, uh, this is another example of sort of figuring out how the number starts and then figuring out what your scale is. So just off the bat, I know with, with a 15 and a three, my number is gonna start with 45. So the question is, how big is, how big is it? Is it 45 million, is it 4.5 million, is it something a lot smaller? So to do that, we have you know, just some quick stepping down to do. So we're starting at 30 million, and that's equal to 100%. So by the time we get down to 10%, that's just 3 million, 1% 300K, and then 0.1% is 30K. And we know that this 0.15% is going to be somewhere between these two numbers, and it starts with a 45, so we know that our answer is going to be 45K without having to worry about counting, counting the decimals. Uh, so really good way to do that. And it is slow to write all of this down. So as long as you can keep track of this in your head one step at a time, you'll be able to get to the right answer pretty quickly. So starting at you know, 30 million, and you can even say this out loud to the person interviewing you, you know, if we have 0.15% of 30 million, if we had 10%, that's 3 million, 1%, that's 300K, and then 0.1% is 30K, but we need 50% more that's 45k or if you already figured out that it starts with the 45 you just know that once you go past it and you're at 30k you need to go a little bit back up the other direction to get to your 45k moving on another example of counting zeros uh, but this time we actually have uh, somewhat of a shortcut so again instead of writing a bunch of zeros we have 100k times 2k and you can combine the two k's and keep that as just million, and then figure out the rest of the number of two times 100. So 200 million, so pretty easy there. So this is one that comes up fairly often. You'll have a number that's a monthly value and you need to get it to a yearly value. So for that, you have to multiply by 12. And typically the easiest way to do that is to take 12 and split that into 10 and two. Uh, so all we have to do is take our 84,000 or 84K and then we're going to multiply it by 10, and then separately we're going to multiply it by 2. So in this case we get, just add a 0, 840k, or step it up once to 840k. And then here we have to double 84, that's 160 plus 8 is 168k. Now we can add the two together. I'm actually going to keep this 8 separate for now because 840 and 160 add together nicely. So that's going to get me to... 1,000, but we have to bring on that 8, 1,000 8K, so 1 million 8,000 is going to be our answer, or 1.008K, uh, depending on, sorry, 1 comma, 1,000 8K, or 1.008 million. Uh, so separating it to 10 and 2, again, you don't have to write these, you don't have to write this side of it down if you can keep track of that in your head, and just say as you go through the math problem, Okay, so we have 84,000 as our monthly. Let's get it to an annual number. So that's going to mean we have 840K 
plus we need to do 84 times 2 is 168. So adding those together, we're going to get 1,008K. So you can talk through it as you're doing the math to save yourself some time writing it down. And it's also a little bit more engaging if, if you talk through the problem as you're going through it. To the rule of 72, this is a great one to have in your back pocket. Um, it helps you discount future cash or figure out what something is going to be worth in a certain number of years time in the future. So the way this works is you take 72 and divide it by your discount rate to get the number of years to double. So what that means is if you have $100 today and it grows at, we'll call it, let's say 12%, so if that is equal to 12%, we can say that 72 over 12 is equal to six. So six years, so money doubles every six years. So if you have $100 today, it's worth $200 in six years. So let's say you have an opportunity to uh, strike a deal that yields $500 million six years from now. It's a one-time one -time payment of $500 million. What is that worth today? So here's our little timeline, zero, six. So you get $500 million then. What is it worth today? So if money doubles every six years, it's one doubling or one cutting in half coming back. So it's equal to $250 million today. You could also do a problem where you have, instead of 500 million in six years, 500 million in 12 years. So again, I think a picture is helpful to have year 12, year 6, year 0, because we know money doubles every 6 years. So 500 million in 12 years is worth 250 million in 6 years, which is worth $125 million today. This is an estimate. It happens to work out pretty well within, I think, 1 or 2% of the actual number. Um, but you can go ahead and take 12% on your calculator. Okay, so it's 2.6% 2. 2. off, but close enough to where it'll get you to the right ballpark for your case interview. Uh, if we didn't have 12% rate, perhaps we had a, um, if we had a 7% rate, then we could do 72 over seven is equal to approximately 10 years to double. Uh, but typically in a case interview, they'll give you a number that comes out to an integer. Um, but anything could happen, so be ready. So if you think about what is a return on investment, if you put money into something, what do you get back out? If your profit is greater than zero dollars, you're going to have a positive ROI. If your investment, is, or sorry, if your profit is less than zero dollars, you're going to have a negative ROI. So Let's say you invest $100 into something and you get $100 back. You take out your initial investment and say that our profit is equal to $0 over 100, which is equal to 0%. You didn't gain money, so you're not positive ROI. You didn't lose money, so you're not negative ROI. So that checks out. But let's say you made a $10 profit, so you walk away with $110, subtract your initial investment, over 100, that means we have our profit of 10 based on our initial investment of $100, and that gets us to a 10% ROI. And then similarly, if you end up with $90 and you invested $100 in this, you have negative $10 of, as profit over 100 is equal to negative 10%. So let's say you lose all of your money. You have now lost everything. You have negative $100 over 100 equals negative 100 percent ROI. So that is the worst you could possibly do, but checks out with our profit being less than zero, negative ROI. On the flip side, if you do really well and you double your money, you walk away with $200 after taking out your initial investment over 100 is 100 over 100, which means that's equal to one or 100% ROI, but you can do better than that. You could double, triple, quadruple your money. So if you walk away with 
after your initial investment of 100, then you divide by 100, that's equal to 300 over 100, which is equal to 300%. So if your business can get 300% ROI, phenomenal. Um, but instead of trying to memorize the formula, just sort of remember your gut check of, if I make a profit, it has to be positive ROI. If I don't make any profit, but I get my initial investment back, I'm at this middle point of 0%. And if I've lost money, I have a negative ROI. So now let's move on to weighted average margins or weighted average could really apply to anything. And also how to keep your math organized. So here it's really important. You have multiple products, maybe you have two, three, four line items. Keeping them in a nice organi organized grid will go a long way. Um, so let's go ahead and work through this problem. Let's say somebody gave you this information, you have two products, they wanna figure out the overall profit margin on average for your portfolio. So you say, okay, for A, I have a dollar, that's half of it. So half of our products sold, we make a dollar margin, half we make a $2 margin. So it's pretty easy common sense to say that our average is somewhere, or is, is right in the middle. But it's usually not 50-50. Um, if we had mostly A, then our profit margin on average has to be closer to that $1 mark. And if we had mostly B, it would be closer to the $2 mark. So let's go through a couple of examples to see how that plays out. So let's say now you have, as if this is just working backwards. So we would say that a dollar at 50%, that's gonna be contributing 50 cents to our average weighted average margin. This is going to be something and this is going to add up to 1.50. So well, based on this, $1.50 minus 50 cents, this has to equal $1. So X times 50% is equal to $1. Therefore, X is equal to $2. Because if we take half of two, 50% of two, we get to $1. So we can fill that in there. So let's make it a little bit more fun this time. If we have a dollar at 60% of our sales and then something else at 40%. So here we can say we have $1 times 60% plus X times 40% is equal to $1.40 times 100%, which is just $1.40. So going through this math, 60% of a dollar is just 60 cents, and then plus something is equal to $1.40. So this something in the middle, x, x is equal to $1.40 minus 60 cents is equal to 80 cents. So 40% of X equals 80 cents. So how do we do this? We have to say point for X is equal to 80 or two fifths of X is equal to 80 and this is 80 cents. Um, so we can divide by two, multiply by five or uh, whatever math operation you want to do to get to this, you can say that this is going to yield x is equal to two dollars. And it makes sense that our average margin is closer to the one dollar mark because the one dollar mark accounts for more of our sales than the two dollar mark. So we can do another example. Um, and here we can just say 50 cents times 30%, that's contributing 15 cents to our average margin of 71 cents. So what's the difference here? Subtract the two, you get 56 cents. So 70% times X or 0.7 X is equal to, is equal to the 0.56. So you can also say seven X equals 56. And then you can say x equals 56 over seven, or this is a nice even eight. 
Um, so once you get that, you can say, based on the scale of the number, I know it's not $8, uh, and I know it has to be above 71 cents to raise the average, so this is going to be 80 cents. And then finally, we'll make it a little bit more fun. So let's have three products this time. And we have product A, 40% of sales, B, 40% of sales, and the remaining 20% for C. So we can go through the exact same process of figuring out how much does each product contribute to the average in the end. So if we look at 80 cents times 40 cents, that gives us 0.32. We have a dollar at 40%, that's just 0.40 and then our total is going to be $1.10. So adding these two together, we get 72 cents. We have to end up at $1.10. So what goes here? Uh, if we add 28 cents, that gets us to $1. We need another 10 cents on top of that. So that's gonna be 0.38. And then we know that that represents 20% of our margin. So 0.2 times X is equal to 0.38. Uh, so what we can do here is just multiply, you know, 0.2 goes into 1 5 times, so 0.38 times 5 uh, gives us $1.90. Or you can say 0.1 is, 0.1x is equal to half of this, or 0.19, and then just shift it over and call it $1.90. So 1.90, and you're good to go.